Good morning, everybody. It is, let's see, about 1040, about 20 minutes to 11 on the East Coast. And I'm going to start today with uh, another stream about um, the setup process. And what we're going to do um, is we're going to go through how I go from just a, a normal baseline or maybe a fix set that, that you get from the from the service uh, to something that you're gonna be comfortable and have fun racing um, let me explain something right off the bat when it comes to to my approach to, to setups and, and racing on the service and things like that um, I may mention it in one of the other streams that I've done so far but first and foremost let's just get this out of the way um, I don't make alien setups. I'm not an alien. Um, how it could be just a, a byproduct of because I, I, I race in the real world and crashing cars are expensive. So in the real world, we don't purposefully make a car um, unstable. We don't set the car up to be unstable just because we know we can race it and be fast that way. Um, we approach the setup from a more conservative aspect and then we f essentially free it up and we make it a little more aggressive uh, to the point where it, it matches the uh, the skill set of the driver and the, cap the capability of the actual race car. Um, so when, when you see these videos and this stuff uh, and these streams and the, the other tutorials that we're going to put out and things like that, we are not, I'm not teaching you how to make an alien setup that's that's going to win a, a top split, you know, race. I, I, I'm, I'm not. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to give you the basic fundamentals and things like that to get you to a point where you understand how to set the car up, what does what, what makes, what adjustments have, which effects on cars, uh, on the handling of the cars, and then you go from there. You know, we're, we're, I'll try and tell you, you know, like, hey, if you want to really go a little bit on the crazy side, this is what you do. Um, you can feel free to go ahead and do that. But these tutorials and this, these setup guides and, and everything like that that I'm doing, I'm, I'm aiming for the new subscriber to, to iRacing. I'm, I'm aiming for... Um, the goal of getting them to a point where where they're not as intimidated by doing this process as somebody who's been around for a while or somebody who's taken the time um, to, to really get elbows deep into books and research and all this other kind of stuff. What we're, like I said, what I'm trying to do is, is encapsulate everything that I've learned into easy to understand, straightforward, layman terms, um, I guess uh, you could say just uh, presentations. That's the word I'm trying to look for so that somebody can come along and, and look at this. And let me um, let me start by saying I understand that I'm not the first person to do this. As a matter of fact, and I have it right over there. Um, as a matter of fact, hold on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go grab this because I think it's interesting, and it's a really nice tribute to the guy. So just a second. Okay. Okay. So, I first got on the, the the service, and I'm just one of those kind of people that that got into. Uh, I I really wanted to learn the technical stuff of it. That's just how I am. And um, the the first thing you do whenever you get onto the service, at least whenever I started, like I don't know, six years ago or however long it's been, is uh, you know you, you head out to YouTube. I mean, you head out to the forums. You you trying to learn. You starting to find all these different sources of information. And this notebook is actually the first thing that I, I wrote anything down in. And if you look, I racing setups from da Mr. David Cater. So, uh, you know, I, I looked at everything that that guy did. And um, and I had the, the pleasure of um, 
of talking with him and chatting with him and different things like that and a lot of setup sessions whenever I really first started in oval racing and things like that and, and he was around a lot. I know he's had some health issues and I hope he's on the mend. Um, so last I heard he was recovering, so I hope he's doing good. But at any rate, David, if you're out there and you're listening, bud, uh, you kind of inspired all this. So thank you. Um, so like I said, one of the things that we're doing here is we're trying to figure out the process of exactly where to start. Okay. You jump into this service and, uh, <laughs> I've been, I'm in a, in a forum debate, uh, a grand old forum debate about the F1 car. I mean, the McLaren MP430 that iRacing, in an attempt to increase the participation, went with the decision to change it to fixed. I get it. I understand the 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 ease of that. I, I understand. And what I... What I want, and I don't want to get into a long diatribe or hop on a soapbox here, but um, if people would understand the basics of, of vehicle setup, you can take um, something and you can make actually a lot of fun racing it, um, especially on the roadside. A roadside is a lot of, and I've said this before, it's a lot more driver stuff. So if you can get a car that you can be aggressive with and be comfortable with, um, you can do pretty well. Um, so uh, you guys may have seen the stream the other day, um, the IndyCar strength field race on Friday afternoon. You know, uh, I do believe I started mid-pack somewhere around 14th maybe, and uh, I finished P8. You know, I got 40 I rating points, you know, 40-something, I guess. And that was just a basic conservative setup, and that was one split. You know, there was some super fast guys in there. And, uh, you know, I finished lap down, but I finished eighth, you know, and like I said in that stream too, and even in the setup stuff, I didn't have a lot of time, you know, that week to uh, to really dive into the car and set the car up and, and really get it to, to where I would get a little more speed out of it. But at any rate, I don't want to digress anymore. What I want to do is take those those new folks to come in, those new drivers, and I don't want them to automatically go to fix just because they have some perception of fixed or they don't they don't want to even touch setting up a car because it's so confusing and it's it, you can get swamped by it. Okay, so that's this is what I this is what I want to do with this whole deal that I have set up. This whole channel that I have set up that's the portion of the channel that's dedicated to i racing and setups and tutorials and things like that. I want somebody to come in and be able to sit down see some tutorials and go, oh, this isn't as bad as everybody makes it out to be. And here's a here's a really good, this is the last thing before I get into everything. Here's a really good example of of how um, misconceptions can be made on the service. Like, everyone's like, the F1 car is the hardest car to drive on the service. It's absolutely, it's impossible to set up, and it's so confusing and everything like that. The MP430 is easier to set up than the IndyCar. <laughs> believe it or not it is actually on par um with the star mazda i'm serious i'm not even joking um if you look at the, the setup options between the star mazda and the mp430 the only difference is is the mp430 has inerters which we'll get into that and when we start getting into dampers and things like that um and inerters are easy to set up. You just set them up at the low end, a couple clicks, do the entire setup, and then come back to the inerters and just keep clicking upwards until the car gets more speed out of it. And then the KERS system, which it's confusing, but you can uh, – it's not that hard to learn. It's people in the forums, in the F1 forums, that will help you out. I mean, there's guides and everything like that. It's not massively difficult. It's just – People are afraid of things that they don't understand or they never really heard of before. So besides those two things, it's almost the same car as a Star Mazda. I'm not even joking. Like I setup-wise, setup-wise. But uh, the car is difficult to drive. It is inherently difficult to drive because it is a high-horsepower car with very, very light weight, especially at slow speeds, and that's where the car is going to kill you. Um, there's not a lot of downforce being generated on that car at low speed. So that's why everyone thinks it's evil, and that's why people can't dial it out in a setup 
and uh, still be relatively competitive. So everyone has this misconception that the F1 car is very difficult to set up, but it's not. So that's the same thing that, that new drivers come in and they see open setups and they're afraid of it. And everyone that I see who are just really pro fixed are like, oh, they have they list all these things that, that you don't want to stay you want to stay away from open because fixed setup solves all these issues and, and different things like that competitive wise or competition wise and everything like that. But so that's what I want. I want some be able to influence the new people coming in and say that, hey, this isn't as bad as that, as everyone else is making it out to be, and it's actually kind of fun, and you don't have to spend 10 hours to, to figure something out. Now, these tutorials are long, and they're long because it always takes you longer to explain something than it is than if you just know it and just go do it. So it may take me 20 minutes to, to figure, to explain you how to set up dampers. In the real world, it takes me five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. So it's it's not that bad. Okay, so first things first. Let's look at the uh, let's look at the process here. Okay, we're gonna come in and well, let me back up one more thing. Okay, so here we are. We loaded up the sim. We're at Daytona Road Course during the day, um, and we're gonna go into the garage. We're using the Vet C7, the Daytona prototype, and we're gonna go to iRacing setups. Here's your options. Four options. All right. We're going to go to the baseline. And I'm going to take a look at what this looks like. Um, spoiler. I, mostly I'm looking at the down four settings. And there's a reason for this, especially at this track. But it translates to other tracks too. Um, 15 and 12. Let's look what the low down force is. Okay. So no dive planes. P6 and 9. All right. We're going to start there. We're not going to use this, this baseline. Um, and here's the reason. I like to start with the least amount of downforce as possible on oval cars, or I'm sorry, on road cars. Uh, and the reason for that is, um, you want the downforce generates drag. The more downforce you dial into the car with, with more wing angles and, and more spoilers and more front dive planes and more gizmos that, that are specifically designed to, to increase downforce on the car also creates drag which slows you down so whether it be you know Interlagos or um, Imola or, or some place with a lot of medium speed corners uh, I like to start low and then work my way up and start building in downforce to the car um, so I've, I've mentioned this in another video I like to start at one end of a spectrum and it may be the low end of a spectrum or the high end of the spectrum on any specific setting and then work your way back. Um, and that's going to be a part of this process that I'm about to explain. So so we're going to go with this uh, low down force. Load you up. Okay. Because A, this is Daytona. I mean, you're, you're on the actual oval track for a long time. Um, speaking of oval tracks and down force, um, the oval car guys, um, you can tell the the spoilers on the car are fixed. They're at a fixed angle. You really can't change anything like that. So how do you change downforce and things like that? Um, and we're going to get into rake. Matter of fact, we're going to get into it in this tutorial. We're going to get into, into the rake. And what rake is, it is the split between the front ride height and the rear ride height. So the front ride height may be to make things simple, three inches, the rear ride height may be four inches. That's a one inch rake or a one inch split. Um, in a NASCAR, the higher you make that split, usually the more downforce the car is going to produce at the end because you're, you're, you're sticking that spoiler higher and higher and higher up into the air, which makes it more and more effective. There's a point of no return where it's just causing you drag and it's not making any more downforce. But if we're going to talk about downforce and where to start as far as downforce goes that's where you start so on oval cars start with the least amount of downforce and a little bit of rake um, usually about a half an inch is where I start because um, you need some you know you need some so a half an inch is a good place to start and then in oval cars um, is actually easier it is much easier in oval cars in oval cars you seal the splitter the front splitter so that's your ride height right there. 
and then the rear, you get it as low as you possibly can without scraping those things that I spoke about in a couple different uh, tutorials. You don't want to scrape the, the lower control arm brackets, and you don't want to to scrape the uh, the uh, right rear bracket for the uh, panard bar or the track arm. Uh, track arm, yeah. Uh, at any rate, the panar bar. Uh, so, let's go and let's take a quick peek at this process. The process. Okay. Um, first things first. Um, you know you have to start somewhere. And, and the place to start um, trans transverses, if that's even a word, I'm making stuff up. Um, it goes across all the, all the cars for the most part. And... Uh, I always say for the most part, just because there you're always going to find some special circumstance um, for one particular car that the community has figured out that this is just where you start. Um, like I said, I'm coming in with it as far as these tutorials go with just a general starting point for the process. So on the process, you want to essentially set up all your defaults. And the first things first, like I said... Um, when we were doing the IndyCar setup is the uh, the dampers, okay? You want to set your dampers to what we call 50-50. And what that means is is that the uh, the range of the dampening or the damping uh, for each setting is in the middle. So if it's like the IndyCars, I think it's like 0 to 23. I usually put it at like a 12. Um, for, let's see... What do we got for this, the DP? And I think they're going to be all different. Yeah. Um, let's see. For the the compression up front, it's like 16, the low speed stuff. So I'll start at 8. The high speed is 12 up front. Um, so I'll start at 6. And then the low speed in the back is uh, 16. So it looks like the low speed uh, stuff is 16 maximum and the, low, and the high speed rebound and the high speed settings for these individual shocks are 12. So I would start at 8 and 6. That's where I would start. It's it's the middle of the road, you know. Um, and then you can go from there. And the reason why we're going to go from there on the dampers is because if you guys remember from the other day, the we use telemetry, and you can tune the, the dampers using the um, shock histogram. And so when you, when you start out in the middle, you can w migrate the settings either way, and you can shape that, that histogram to how you want it. And we're going to get to that. And uh, I really need to do probably one of the next one tutorials that I do is going to be getting into telemetry because I use a lot of telemetry. And um, if I'm going to base my tutorials off telemetry, I should probably show you guys how to get into telemetry. That's pretty logical. Okay, um, so what we're looking at here is uh, the dampers are 50-50. The, the sway bars or the ARBs, the anti-roll bars, as I said also on the, uh, in the IndyCar setup thing, uh, our tutorial, um, I set them in the middle because you want adjustability in the car. I do believe, and I haven't driven the Corvette in a while, but I do believe you can adjust the ARBs in here too. Okay, so whether or not you're setting it uh, to get dial in some adjustability for in-race adjustments or just as a starting point for your setup, even if you can't adjust them in the car, I set the ARBs to the middle. Okay, for the oval, the oval side, guys, the, the ARB is, the front sway bar is, it's kind of a, I don't want to say like it's a magic thing, but there's different philosophies on sway bars in oval track racing. You have really big bars, um, and then you use soft springs if you want to do a, what they call a BBSS kind of a setup. Um, believe it or not, I have heard that these, at least the circle track world is migrating back away from the big bar um, soft spring setup, so that's good because my late model's old as heck, and I don't have <laughs> that the the geometry up front, um, the capability of making those kind of setups. So yay, we're going back to that. Um, 
everything old is new again, as they say. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So on the on the oval side, it depends on what car you have. But if you're using a short track car like um, an SK, late model, super late, um, even a street stock, I like to start out on the smaller bar, okay, because it it helps the car rotate uh, middle out. So you start there and then you start dialing in start I should say start dialing out any kind of oversteer that you have on the way out um, and then for the the NASCAR stuff that's a whole different ball game whenever you get into the use of the sway bar um, that's a whole different ball game and we'll get into that um, because when you start getting into the sway bar in the in the NASCAR stuff you're talking about asymmetry you're talking about preloads doing different things and they're using the asymmetry for a, a lot of different stuff and um, there's a really good sticky in the uh, gen 6 form about i think maybe in all the nascar forms i haven't checked but i was just looking at it today um, about asymmetry and what it does and whenever we get to arb section especially for the nascar stuff we're going to get into what they do and why they do it um okay so let's just keep going um the toe this is sort of a driver preference kind of a setting but like I said I like to start at one point and then migrate away from it and here's the reason that you start where I'm about to say that you start and the on the roadside you want none you don't want anything and people are gonna be like wait a second I can I can hear heads exploding right now as you set the toe out more you actually get more aggressive on turn in and that's awesome. That's that's great. Uh, and I get it. But in the process of setting the car up, um, there are major fundamental things. And then you start working your way down to the little stuff. And tow, in my opinion, is a little thing. You want to get all the big suspension variables optimized first before you get into the smaller detail stuff like tow or cam or a caster okay so on row courses because and I'm I've, I've seen this question asked before and I can't remember exactly if iRacing has said that they model it I'll, I'm gonna have to ask if if they model bump steer or Ackerman um, it all just depends on what that is and essentially long story short and I'll get into this whenever we start getting into camber and caster as the suspension compresses and travels up and down you will actually, because of how the steering linkage is and how everything's mounted in the car, you can actually start turning the wheels without even turning the steering wheel. The, the, the travel of the suspension is going to turn um, the individual tires or wheels um, at different rates. In the oval track world, we try and dial that out completely. And I'm sure you, you try and dial it out completely in road track, too. I've just never raced road track. Um, in the real world but at any rate there's no settings for that so we're just going to imagine that it's not there and the easiest way to get around even if it is there is to just set the toe at one thing and then dial it in towards the end of the setup and that's going to be optimized anyway because even with even if they do model bump steer and ackerman and all that kind of stuff you have to get everything else right first and then you start going with it, setting the toe and setting everything else. So it's one of the last things we do in the real world anyway. Um, so on the front, set it to zero on the row cars. On the oval, you always want a little bit, okay? So if I remember correctly, the oval cars are anywhere going to be between um, 16th of an inch uh, adjustments, maybe 32, 30 seconds uh, increments. Um, but at any rate, Dial yourself in a little bit, one or two clicks. In the front, you want negative. In the back, um, the oval is a, also a little bit different um, because they they set those uh, the toe on the back to help the car rotate through the corner. So we'll get to that whenever we get to that. But uh, I believe in the back, it's um, toe in on the left rear and toe out on the right rear so you go around um, helps to swing the back of the car around 
Um, but, but like I said, we'll get to there. But on a road co- in a oval car, I say on a road course, I'll get there. Um, for example, the Corvette is is one sixteenth positive. You know you need a little bit, and especially on long straights, circuits with really long straights, you don't want to dial in a massive amount of towing. If you have to dial in a massive amount of towing to keep the car stable under acceleration, there's something else wrong with the car. Um, and as you tow the the rear tires in, the front of the tires, you're actually aiming towards the, the center line of the vehicle. And the more towing you, you put into the car, the actual more you in, uh, introduce rolling drag into the car because now the tires aren't rolling perpendicular to the travel of the vehicle. They're Now they're skewed in, you know. So it's like trying to run with your toes, your feet pointed in. You're not going to go as fast. Um, so on the, on the roadside, um, toe in one or two clicks, um, usually one sixteenth of an inch is, is perfectly fine. So the rear end in the particular car you have to be setting up is in 30 seconds of increments do two thirty seconds, which is one sixteenth. Um, that's a good place to start. And if in the end, um, you just can't dial some instability out of the car under acceleration, with everything else that you've done, the diff, other stuff, go start dialing in some toe, some rear toe. All right, so then you have to determine your fuel load. <clears throat> like in the IndyCar, it's easy. Uh, we run pretty much full fuel loads. Um, I know in GT3s, I believe you guys run full fuel loads. Um, you just don't take tires during pit stops. Um, but when you get to, like, uh, I know the F1, we, we run partial fuel loads. It just depends. Maybe 66%. Depends on the length of the race. Um, or if you're setting your car up for a league, you know, your league may run 25% races or whatever. But you have to figure out how much fuel to put in it because that affects ride heights. Um, and it affects the amount of, of weight that you're going to have, the amount of weight transfer you're going to have in the car. So, like, that's one of the first things that you do. You figure out how much fuel you need. So in our situation today, we're going we're gonna to pretend that we're just going to just pump it full of fuel, top it off, and we'll go from there. Um, and then what you do is this takes a lot of a lot of testing and stuff like that. And I've said this before in the IndyCar setup tutorials. You set your first gear to get your best launch either on the start or, more importantly, out of the lowest speed corner on the circuit. So... The lowest speed corner that you have, you want to set your first gear so you get the best launch that you possibly can out of that corner. Okay, and then the top gear, um, in this case for the Corvette, is sixth gear. You set that to give you the peak of the, the RPM range at the end of the longest straight. And you have to fudge a little bit um, if you're testing by yourself. Um, maybe make the gear maybe one option taller or maybe two options taller just to build in some uh, space for draft, you know, because these, especially here at Daytona, you're going to have a massive amount of, of draft, you know, because you're just on the flat out wide open throttle for so long. So you have to set, set the car up for that. Um, but here's here's something quick too. If you're setting up a qualifying setup, you know, then you would set the sixth gear or the top gear f- to hit the the max RPM at the end of the longest straight. After you do that, all the middle gears, um, you just take the miles per hour that uh, they they call qualif- they calculate in the garage. You take the top mile per hour, you take the first gear mile per hour, you subtract them, and then you divide by however many gears that there is in between. So, like, for example, on this low down force setting car, or uh, slow down force setup for the DP, six gear is set to top out at 195.8 miles an hour. First gear is set to be 89. So we break out the trusty calculator, 195.8. Minus 
89 equals 106.8. There's 106.8 miles an hour. And you divide that by how many gears it takes to get to six. So you go from first to second, second to third, third to fourth, fourth, fifth, fifth to sixth. So that's five gear changes. Okay. So you divide that by five. And then you, at any rate, this is a, I swear I know how to use a calculator. There was something else already programmed in here, and I didn't clear it out. Okay. Divided by 5 equals 21.36. You top that into memory. So, in this case, you have 195.8. That's the top gear. You subtract... 21.36 so you set the next gear at 174.4 and in this baseline setup that we have here this low down force base it's a 173.5 you're never going to get it close because they limit the amount of options that you have as far as gearing goes so at any rate that's the basic process of what you do after you go and you test and you figure out the first gear and then the sixth gear um, and again like I said it takes a long time to explain this stuff but when you go out there it really doesn't take that long um, you figure out your your initial spring package for the car, okay? Um, it depends on the car that you're that you're driving. If it's a road course car, um, I like to start off with uh the softest springs that you possibly can. Um, and then, like I said, it all depends, but you have to start somewhere. So I like to do either the soft springs or the stiff springs. And that sounds very, very general and very, very on the fence. But there's there's, there's a reason for it. It just depends on what you're comfortable with. The, You don't want to start with the stiffest front springs because the rear springs usually have to be, uh, on most cars, some cars, it depends on where the engine is. Um, like on a front engine car, the rear springs have to usually be a little bit higher. Um but it just depends on the car, I guess. At any rate, you have to start somewhere with the spring package. So in the DP, I mean, we have a range of 500 to 1,500, and they're starting at 1,150. So there's nothing wrong with with starting there because you're kind of towards the, the top end of the spectrum anyway. So that's where we're going to start. Um, and then the rear goes up to 1,500, and they are at... 1100 so you can start with the default springs I guess that would probably be the best way that I would say to do it um, for the simple reason is is that I've been driving F1 a lot and the uh, the IndyCar a lot and those guys I've, I've already defaulted to I kind of know where to start so for coming in cold things like that starting off with uh, with what the fixed has you know, that that would probably be a pretty good thing. So let's just start out with that. We'll make it easy. Okay. And then um, the ride heights. So you want to set the car up, and I said this with the Indy car and things like that. And it's kind of the same thing. The GT cars, they're they're actually not that, that bad as far as bottoming out um, that, I, that I've seen. I haven't driven them a lot. But the basic premise is you want to set the, the ride heights high enough that the car isn't bottoming out with the spring package that you selected. Um, softer springs will increase the travel and you'll actually let the car squat more. Um, so those two things work hand in hand. The ride heights and the springs uh, package determine um, if the car is going to scrape or not. <clears throat> so that's the other place that you have to get actually right. So on the ride heights and things like that, we're actually going to leave it um, <clears throat> on the Corvette where it is. I just want to see where it's at. So that's one other thing that you can set. On the GT type of cars, in my experience, I, I just slam them. The front ride heights, I slam them down as low as they'll possibly go. Because in my experience, I haven't seen the point where whatever circuits that I just happen to probably get lucky on, on racing those GT cars on, I haven't uh, bottomed out. Okay, so we talked about earlier about rake okay and um so what do you set the rear ride heights to all right so the front ride heights 
you set. <clears throat> Excuse me. I should have something to drink. Um, you set the, the front ride heights, GT, low as you can possibly go. Um, you'll find out um, just through testing. It's a cycle um, just to get this set up properly for your spring rates and then your, your ride heights. You set the ride height up front to make sure that it doesn't scrape, give it a spring. So you go back to the rears, ride heights, and you want to build in what we call a rake, like I mentioned earlier. And you don't want to go too crazy um, because when you start dealing with with ride heights and things like that, you're going to start messing around with, with center of gravity heights. And um, I'm going to show you that in just a second right after I'm done with this. So your initial rake that you set into the car, you need some. You're never going to have negative rake. You're never going to have the rear of the car lower than the front of the car. Um, in a conventional setup. If the aliens have figured out something else, knock yourself out. You know, like, if they figured out how to coil bind, you know, the rear of the car, and you have to get the, the ride height in the back down low, and then you use a specific spring, and then it just locks it there, I have no idea. But this is for beginners, novices. You always want a little bit more rake in the back than you do the front. So, for example, on the Corvette car here, we're at 17.4 inches on... I'm sorry, 1.74 inches on the front and 2.398 inches on the back. That's a lot. Um, if you come in and look, 2.398 on the old trust calculator again, minus 0.74. That's uh, about a quarter, uh, three quarters of an inch, 0.658. So I don't know why my head it actually sounded a little bit more than what it was, but it's not that bad. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to drop these things down a little bit. And we're going to start out with a half an inch. So so like 2.25 is what we're going to get these things down to. And I know I still have the thing up uh, as far as like the, the process graphic. And it's probably not very exciting. Um, but I, I'm almost going to be done with it. Okay. So then, then the rear differential, um, as far as the, the actual basic opening things before you even go out on track, <clears throat> is that you know that you're going to need some um, preloading into the diff. You, you know it. Um, so if you have an uh, option to select the amount of clutch plates that you have, or for the Corvette, they call it clutch friction faces. Um, I don't know, never heard that term before, but um, it's probably the same as clutch plates. Like one clutch plate, you actually we just pick a normal plate, has two faces on it. So uh, six face, six faces on the clutch friction plate here that w in the setting here, six, it's probably like a three plate system. Um, and you can go all the way up to 12, which is six clutch plates in the, uh, in the diff. But that's just a guess. That's just what it sounds like. Oh, it looks like you can go down to two. So you can go down from one clutch plate all the way up to 12. That's a lot of, uh, adjustment. But, so in this case, like, we know it's not going to be two. We know it's not going to be two. So we'll start off with four. Um, <clears throat> and then you want to dial in some preload because you know you need some. You don't want a whole heck of a lot, but you do need some. So on the Corvette, you can go from 0 to 120. All right. So let's start out with 30. Because, <clears throat> like I said, we know we're going to need some, and 20 is going to be really, really super optimistic. But here's – let's talk about ramp angles. Um, this is where, when I say you start off at one end of the spectrum – um, this is where that comes into play, and this is the reason. I want, I do not want to worry about the car trying to kill me every single lap. I want to go out and turn laps, get comfortable in the car. I need to figure out, uh, tire pressures. I need to figure out ride heights. I need to, to rough in what spring package I want to run. I do not want to worry about the rear end trying to swap 
ends of the car around every single time I come into a corner. So I set up the the ramp angles on the on the differential in at each end of the spectrum. So as far as let's start off with corner entry, the coast ramp angle. Um, if you haven't seen some of the other uh, tutorials when I talk about it, if these are, say like this is the pinion gear, this is the ring gear, and you could choose on the drive when the tires are turning like this, this end, if these are the teeth, my fingers are the teeth, when the teeth are like this, these teeth are at a, at a specific angle, and as the tires are driving the car forward, they're up against this side of the teeth of the gears. Whenever you start to decelerate under braking, those teeth swap positions and they go uh, against the other face of the gears. So they actually go between the teeth like that. So if you have acceleration, you come into a corner, you hit the brakes, decel. Okay. So the angles at which these teeth are ground into the gear or ground into um, there's plates in the differential, and I'm going to do a differential tutorial. I'm actually going to rip apart the extra. Um, locking diff that I have in the garage and I'm going to show you um, but they determine how stable or unstable the car is going to be because they're going to determine how locked together the tires are going to be if they're going to spin at the same rate or the diff is going to open up and allow them to spin at different rates so cutting just to the chase the coast ramp angle the the lower the number it has more locking force, okay? So the lower the number, the more it's going to try and keep those tires locked together, spinning at the same speed. And that equates to stability. So the adjustment for the DP goes anywhere between 30 and 90. So what we're going to do, we know it's not going to be 30. We're going to start that off at 40. On the other hand, okay, the drive ramp angle, um, the more locking it has, the more oversteer the car usually has. Um, so what we want is the least amount of ramp angle, so the least amount of locking force. So again, the maximum is 90, the lowest is 30. We know it's not going to be 90, so let's come down to 80. Okay. So that's what where that's going to be. So, all right. So you've been staring at this process graphic for long enough. All right. And I didn't want to swap back and forth because it's I, I, it'd be annoying just for me to watch it. So I didn't want to watch. So I just leave these on. So, so let's come from that and uh, let's take away this. Hey, how's it going? Um, I can't believe I didn't have my face up there so you guys couldn't see me. Uh, crap. Like I said, I'm still getting used to the stream and stuff. So let's look at the, uh, let's move my camera all the way up, and let's look at dynamic weight balance. All right, cool. So here we go. I know this looks technical. Don't invest too much into it, okay? <laughs> uh, I'm going to explain some basic stuff really, really quick. Um, I have a longer tutorial. It's in the uh, Beelzebub Gen 6 uh, forum. And uh, it's a longer tutorial that deals with this. Okay, but we're just going to be really, really basic. Um, the squiggly lines here represent springs. Squiggly line here represents springs. This coil actually um, is chassis torque. Torque, chassis. Um, how much the the is going to the front of the car and the back of the car is going to twist. That's all in consideration too. And iRacing does model that. Um, but what you see here is pretty self-explanatory. You have the uh, the wheels, and then you have the axles. Okay, you have the axle wheels, and then you have this line here. Essentially, represents the chassis of the car. Okay, in relation to the front axle, and this is the rear axle. All right. This symbol that you see here, um, that is what you call the center of gravity. That is a center of gravity symbol. And that tells you of all the weight that is acting, that is pressing down on that front axle, that represents that weight. And then it's the same in the back. So you have 
height in the front, you have height in the back or rear. Okay, so where does this come into play? That's that's it. Um, the higher that center of gravity is, the higher the weight is mounted in the car. So, for example, on our late model, we want the engine as low as possible because it is just one large, huge lump of lead, essentially, or steel, or aluminum, or whatever is all comprised of that motor. It's just one big weight ballast. And the higher up that the uh, that the chassis is, and the higher up that the engine is in the car, the more the weight will transfer to one side. Okay, so that's why performance cars sit so low to the ground because that way um, you don't take as much weight off of one tire and bloat it up on the other tire. So um, you keep all four tires with as much weight on this as possible. So where does this all come in? What the heck we're talking about now? We're talking about rake. Let's go back to rake for a second. So the front of the car you want as low as possible without it scraping. And then what do you want the back to do? Okay. You want to start that out. Like I said, I started out about a half an inch. And then you start want to ticking that up a little bit because the front of the car is going to roll a certain amount. Okay. A balanced car, the front and rear of the car will roll over the same amount. Okay. That's, that's a dynamically balanced car. So that's the optimal condition that we want. So the front of the car is set. We want it as low as possible. Okay. Especially, especially in a, in a engine that's up front of the car. That's almost on the front axle. Okay. So you want that as low as possible. So that while you're driving around is going to roll over X amount. It's going to roll over a certain amount. You want to set the back of the car to do the same thing. Well, in the back, you really can't. You can put in a little bit of lead ballast maybe to the to the back. And do they actually have ballast on here? Roll bar settings, sexual, no. Okay, so like in this particular instance, um, you don't have any ballast that you can move back and forth in the car. In a circle track car, you do. In Indy car, you do. In the F1 car, you do and maybe some other cars you make. So that's another way to just change the amount of roll that the car is experiencing. Another way is with ride height, okay? So this back line right here represents the chassis, okay? Because the chassis rides on the springs. The springs are attached to the axle, and the axle is attached to the, to the tire. So the axle doesn't go up and down because the tires don't go up and down. Um, in relationship to height um, to the ground. The chassis, on the other hand, is going to heave, roll, you know, and do different things like that. So the right height back here, the adjustment on the right height, is going to move your center of gravity up and down, okay? Which is why we start with a minimal amount of rake because you want everything to be as low as possible. So that's where you start um, because that is the optimal condition. And then you want to adjust the least amount possible to get the car balanced. Um, a quick thing, um, this is so apparent in GT3 cars. Um, this, the rake for GT3 is, is very, very important, especially on some of the cars that have extremely limited spring package combinations because of the balance of power of the BOP that the series has set for that car. So you may not be able to get the car to, to, to roll equally because you want to set the front springs up to get you through the corner to get corner entry good. And then you want, you have to get the back of the car to work in conjunction with the front of the car. Um, so if you can't, if you run out of options with the springs, and you can't dial in more weight transfer in the back with springs, you just start increasing the rake, and you are going to increase, you're going to start moving this center of gravity up, okay? And then that is, in turn, going to throw more weight over to the side. So that's a tip for the GT3 cars, okay? So that's about the basics of that. Let's take this away. Whoops, let's not take that away. Let's take that away. All right.
So here we are. We're looking at the uh, the garage settings in the uh, Corvette C7. We're finally getting to some meat and potatoes on here. I don't know how long I've been streaming for, but uh, I'm sure you guys are running out of patience. Um, then the other thing is uh, tire pressures. And I said this before. If you're going to race a car, you need to know um, where your optimal tire pressures ranges is. Um, it's You're going to have a low number. You're going to have a high number. And you're looking at hot pressure. You're not looking at cold pressure. Um, you have an optimum range for hot pressures. So what I said earlier in some other videos was finding that range is time consuming, and I'm not going to lie. Um, it's not like 20 hours or anything like that, but you're going to have to go out there on a you know default weather day, and you're going to have to figure out the where the where the peak is for that particular track and that particular car and where the where the best performance you're going to get um, from the hot tire pressures and then there's going to be a range off of that that you go with because you're going to go to different tracks and different tracks and you're going to have different um, yeah you're going to go to different tracks and different tracks like different hot tire pressures um, high speed corners as I had said in different tutorials like more pressure because yeah you they you need the stiffness the more pressure a tire has, the more stiff the tire is, the more resistant it is for what I like to call slop, um, or I think they call it sidewall compliance or something along those lines. Um, the tire doesn't flex as much. And then on low speed corners and things like that, you the car usually likes lower tire pressures. So you have to go out and you have to figure out what the what your ranges are and the thing is to get the baseline at one track that you know preferably go to either a very a track with a lot of low speed corners and then go to a track with a lot of high speed corners okay and then when you go to that track or those particular tracks you go to um, you can either do I like to do the lowest uh, track temperatures that you can get into the sim just because it's more comfortable to drive. Um, so once you set get that, you can say like, okay, this track has this low speed corner track. The optimal tire pressure is this, and chances are it'll be lower, and uh, on the low end. And then you go to a high speed track. Say like a really good one is Watkins Glen. Um, another good one might be uh, maybe like Spa. Um, but whichever one you want to pick. So you'll, you'll get your bracket like that. Um, so you can start out like at the, the low speed track, and then you're like, okay, I know the, the optimal low end of the spectrum is here. Let's go over to this fast high speed corner track, maybe like uh, Suzuka, and then this is the high speed. And so then you, there you have your optimal range for the car. Okay, so when you come to a different track, you can say, okay, I know basically where to start at. So for the DP, here the default is <laughs> the default is cold pressure is 20 to 30 all right and here's my here's my problem this and this is why I don't like fixed um this basic low downforce setup is set at the absolute minimum cold tire pressures that you can start the car out i will guarantee you that is not optimal. I guarantee you that. So we're going to start there, and it's going to be sloppy. And I know it's not going to be sloppy, and, but we're just going to leave it there just for grins. Um, all right. So let's just take this car, and here we are at the chassis session, or section. All right. So let's do... Let's set up, let's see, let's start at the top. We'll just do that. We'll start at the top. Here's your options for that. I'm going to go soft. Let's see. Air B's anywhere from 1 to 5. I'm going to go 3. Okay. Brake pressure. This depends on what the range is. 65 down to 49. 
I'll start at around 59. It, that's too much. But I like starting brake pressure further forward because that is the most stable. Okay. Um, you're going to get lock up, sure. But at least you're just going to lock up and you're not going to spin the car out and ruin a, a whole, like, test run. Okay. So toe, like we said, up front on these cars, set them at zero. Um, the engine map setting. Uh Let's toss the most power into it as possible, because this is when you start getting into your fuel load, uh, fuel calculations, and things like that. Um, set up max power. That way, you you know you have much fuel you're going to be, the max amount of fuel you're going to be doing. Um, traction control. I never really mess around with this, to be completely freaking honest with you. But uh, one is off. Six is the most support. So let's just start it off with six, and then we'll work our way back. Because six is probably going to be the most supportive, and it is going to be the most stable. Uh, steering assist. Eh, one of these things that I just don't mess around with. This is car specific to this, and I'm sure there's a couple other DPs that are out there, prototype-esque kind of cars that are that are like that. So that's that's going to be a driver preference kind of a setting. So whatever you like, have at it try different stuff um so here we have the the ride height so we're gonna like we said earlier we're gonna leave that there um the push rod length works the same as spring perch does in oval track cars and that is going to change your uh, ride heights spring rates we talked about that we're just gonna leave them where they are because it's the front is kind of close to the top end 1500 and you can go all the way down to five so uh, maybe it isn't top, maybe it's in the middle. But we'll leave it here just for just for grins. And so we talked about the 50-50 dampers. So let's take 16, we're going to go down to 8, 5, 8, or 6, 8, 6, 8, 6. So that's already half done for us. 8, 6. All right, camber settings. Let's see where we are as far as how crazy these things can get. So five and two and a half. Okay, here's what I like to do. We know it's not going to be positive. We know that. We know it's not going to be flat. I'm going to start out at 1.5 because you know you're going to need a little bit of camber. Okay, because here, negative is the, the front end. So on a road car, you want them symmetrical, and you want both tires towed in, or uh, cambered in. You want negative tam camber. So when you go around a corner, that tire will flatten up. When you go around this corner, that tire will flatten up, and you'll maximize contact patches. So let's look at casters. Let's look at the range of casters. 11 all the way down to 7. We can start out pretty much, and this is a, a just a thing with me. I like half degrees. I don't know why. I just always do. Um, so it's it's easier for me to make um, changes because I can do things in half degrees or full degree um, adjustments. Uh, so, and then when you start getting into like tenths of a degree, that's, that's alien stuff right there. That's not what we're here for. Um, so I did set the, uh, the ride heights while we were talking about the, the basic stuff and we said we're going to keep the spring rates in the back pretty much the same. And the cool thing about this is, is that the rear spring package, um, range is the same as the front spring package range. And this is a mid... This is a mid-engine car for the most part. I think it's a little, it's like right behind the driver. So it's a, it's more of a mid-range, a mid-engine car. Uh, then the camera on the back. Like I said, you can get ridiculous. And you can go plus on the positive side. But we know we're not going to go to the positive side. But let's just do one. Okay. Fuel level is maxed out. ARB. I want the front and the back ARB. 
to be the same. We did soft up front. Let's do soft in the back. All right. A quick thing while I'm thinking about it as far as anti-roll bars go, the st and you can see this in the in the garage tool tip. Um, the stiffer in the front, the more understeer you are going to have. And in the back, the stiffer the back, the more oversteer you're going to have. Um, so the the range on the ARB here is 1 to 5. I think we did 3 up top. Let's do 3 in the back too. Cool. Um, toe in. Like I said, we want about one click. So plus positive 1 16th of an inch. Um, so that means that both rear tires are going to be angled towards the center line of the car by 1 16th of an inch. And let me explain to you whenever you start having this um, one toe adjustment for two tires. This is actually 1 16th total. So you have 1 32nd on one, you have 1 32nd on the other, you add them up together, you get 1 16th. Didn't know you are going to be doing math. Um, so that's how that works. So essentially, keep that in mind. Um, on NASCAR and on circle track cars, I believe, I know definitely NASCAR ones, you can do this individually. And uh, most road cars, I do believe, they are just uh, one. Excuse me, one setting. So, drive train. Um, we're going to keep these here just as a ballpark. And then, like I was saying earlier, um, when we said just the out-of-the-gate differential settings, you know it's not going to be two. We're going to do four clutch friction faces. And then the preload, I mean, it goes down to zero. But we know we're not going to need that. So, we're going to do 20 because the max range is 120. So we're down here on the lower side. So 20 or 30. Let's just do 30 just for grins and see where we're at. The drive ramp angle, like I said, the most, uh, the higher numbers are the least amount of locking, which is more forgiving. So I like more forgiving when you're doing initial testing. Um, for the coast ramp angle, um, the lower numbers produce more locking, which e equates to more stability. And I didn't have my, my camera on the stream before, and I'm going to do that now. So when you talk about coast and drive ramp angles in a differential, you're talking about the gears and the angle of the actual splines in the gears, and um, or the teeth in the gears. Um, so 80 degrees, that's almost straight up and down. And then the coast at 40 degrees, um, that's more laid flat. Um, and essentially, if the Let's say this is the pinion gear, this represents the pinion gear, this hand, and this hand represents the ring gear coming into the car. Um, and the wheels are driving the car forward like this. The gear teeth, which are my fingers, go to the drive side of the the, the ring gear. Okay, or the, both gears have a drive side and a coast side. but So they lock like that. And then under deceleration, under braking, the teeth snap to the other side okay so what you're doing with these angles and things you're you're adjusting the angle of the teeth in the in the ring on uh, in the gears to keep them from slipping or to allow a certain amount of slip and things like that uh, and then I'll be completely honest these gears that they're talking about the the angles could be um, gears actually in the differential um, the two differential plates that come together, um, that that could probably, that may be in this car. Like when I talk about ring gears and, and drive and coast sides of of gears and a, and a differential, I'm an oval track guy. Um, and I started off oval track racing uh, in stock, actual street stock cars. And so our ramp angles and things like that um, really have to do with the actual ring gear and the pinion gear and things like that. Because the differentials that we can buy um, from what I've seen, um, cause I hadn't, I didn't run one in my street stock and I do run one now in the late model. I haven't tearing and torn it apart yet to see what it is, but, um, these are, uh, could be in the discs and things like that. But at any rate, the, the, the concept is the same. Um, 
whether it be the actual locking mechanism inside the differential is going to have a drive side with teeth and a coast side with teeth. Um, and then the preload is, is how much tension those things have and where those teeth are located in relationship to each other, like in and out. Um, so that's basically how that works. So that's how we're going to set that up. All right, so here we go. We get into full screen mode, and we're actually start going to do some driving because I believe I'm BSing for a while, and we haven't really done anything. Probably views have probably bailed out, um, but I hope not. It always seems like you're talking longer than, or shorter amount of time than what you are. So, all right, we got the telemetry recording, and uh, I haven't driven this car or track in a while, so you have to keep in mind that um, there is a little bit of relearning that comes into this. Which brings me to another point. Um, when you're dealing with setups and setting up a car and, and just marathon setup sessions in a car, you have to understand that your mind will adjust to whatever setup that you have in there. It, it does it automatically. And so you may have a uh, an unstable setup that you just get used to driving. And that's, I'm going to say that's just how the aliens do it. But um, so be cognizant of that. When you sit down and do a setup and you're going to sit down for like two or three hours and work on a setup, there is a lot of stuff performance-wise that is going to be driver adjusted for and some stuff that is uh, actual setup, suspension adjustments, you know, that you do. So just be cognizant that, like, that's a factor. So, like, when I do a setup session, like, I, um, I'll work for a certain amount of time, then I'll leave. I'll walk away. Uh, because when you come back, like, if, if it feels good, the setup feels good, and you're, and you're pretty happy with it, and then you come back, and the car is just junk. Like, now. Um then, you know, that's a way to say that, hey, you know, that was something that your body adjusted to. You just happened to, you don't get a good setup. You adjusted to a bad one. So, if you're a subscriber, you know that the more I talk, the less I can drive. Maybe the less I talk, the even the less I can drive. But I will tell you what, if we're going to start at a 20 degree or a 20 psi cold pressure. There's going to be a lot of instability in the car, so I probably don't suck as bad as these initial opening laps look like. So the fastest part of the track, we're almost tapping out. As far as uh, RPMs. I don't know if that's the fastest part of the track or if this is the fastest part of the track. I'm pretty sure this might be, now that I think about it. Because there's not a lot of run between coming out of the infield to the bus stop. But even so, this looks pretty good. Like, I ran this in the 24 hours with the team. And uh, I can tell you that, that our setup that we had is night and day different from whatever this is.
So you can tell the, the tires are starting to build some pressure and they're not as much of a train wreck as uh, they were in the initial opening laps. But I do know the breaking point that I'm using for turn one entry is, uh, I mean, it has to be a good 100 meters short of what we were doing in the uh, in the 24 hours, whatever year it was that, that I did it. Like, I just tried to do where we were normally breaking into, and that was the result. So this is one of the reasons why I don't like fixed <laughs> and this is the other reason why that I don't <laughs> I, I, I gotta make sure I don't get on a soapbox because I'm gonna tell you what if you get a brand new subscriber and they come in here and they get in this car and they start doing this they're gonna be like I don't know what this simulator is simulating but it sure the heck isn't a race car um, I think this is where people get like the all oh, the tires are junk and this that, and the other thing or remember when Dale Earnhardt Jr., who was the biggest proponent of this service, kept making the uh, comments of ice ice skating on the tires. Now, obviously, he's smart enough to know that you can change the adjustment and the uh, PSI and things like that, obviously. But uh, the tire model that he was working on was not really good. But for a new subscriber coming into this car, thrown in this baseline and things like that, there's no reason to have the cold tire pressure set at what they're set. So that's one of the things, my little soapbox, that I wish iRacing would do. Like, actually put a stable setup in here. I don't know who they have making these things, but... Um, you could get a a better experience for a new person that time is abysmal by the way So what we're going to do is we're going to put together a couple of laps until we get a little bit more consistency in the car. Or I can get a little more consistent with this setup that we have in here. And then we're going to start making some changes. Goodness gracious. Can't even stop the car. And here's something else with this type of provided setup. People coming in think this is right. You know what I'm saying? Like, they come in, they're like, oh, let's, we'll start off with the fixed. And then they get in this car and they can't drive it. Now, you may, maybe this setup... Uh, you like it you know as, as you can see I can't drive it but maybe you like it because you got used to driving on tires with 20 PSI or cold air pressure in it so we're starting to get a little more consistent with bad laps they like said you gotta when you gotta start you gotta start someplace and this is it. If 
you guys are wondering, I do believe the uh, the world record for here is 36, but I actually didn't see if it was at night or during the daytime. Because even now, even with setting the car up just initially out of the gate to a point where I thought that it would be stable, it's still pretty unstable. Um, so I'm going to guess that's due to tire pressures. And you may ask, why do you keep using different cars? And the reason is, is because the stuff that I'm talking about translates between cars. I'm used, I'm talking about basic vehicle dynamics and basic setup procedures. They go between all cars. So I want to show you that you can make improvements using those philosophies on whichever car you want as we Tokyo drift it through turn one yet again. So, I'm starting to get acclimated to the instability that's in the car. And I'm going to tiptoe back on my soapbox. About fixed. You can't, it just isn't comfortable. You know, like, okay, I get it, everyone's running the same setup, but you're not getting the best out of each driver on that particular fixed setup. What you have to get is the person who has a natural advantage, who prefers that setup, and who would prefer that setup if they were setting up their own car. So that's a natural advantage right there versus somebody who likes to be more aggressive on the braking like me. Who can't get through a, a normal corner that I was able to take you know, at the limit of the car. Like, I can't get the car to the limit because the setup is limiting, not because the driver is limited. So whenever I talk about some of the misconceptions of fixed racing, this is, this is the reason. You know, like, I want to drive against a driver who knows how to get the most out of the car. So I'm getting 100% out of the driver, and that driver's getting 100% out of the car. Not a driver who happens to be able to get 80% out of the driver and get 90% out of the car. So, off the soapbox. Okay, we're gonna bring this in this time and we're gonna see what the heck we got going on. Um, and we're gonna go right to the fundamentals. Okay, and the first things first is going to be the differential and when the tire pressures. And oh, if you're wondering, this is not a track guide, so no, I'm not taking the best possible lines through the corners. That just so you know. Okay. So here we are. Oh, I forgot I had this paint scheme on here. Nice. Uh, 
I love this cool band of paint scheme. That was the reason why I love this cool band of paint scheme is because my first matchbox car that I can remember. Um, well, I had two or three that I remembered. The emergency 51 or just emergency, their uh, squad car, and uh, a Porsche 928, and then Harry Gantz, um, Skull Bandit Grand Prix. Those are the three. All right, so let's look and see, mother of God, what we got going on here. Okay. So you can see the tire, the, the rollout tire pressures or the hot tire pressures. Um, you see where they're, where they fell. Um, and so what we're going to do is when you say driver's notebooks and things like that, turn off my ball fan. If you wonder what I just said, I said I have to turn off my ball fan, which is the fan that I have behind the rig that blows up my legs and uh, keeps me cool. We just have to call it a ball fan because it is aimed at your man parts. Okay, so um, you're talking about 25.7, 26.8. Twenty-five point six and twenty-four point eight. Okay, so those are the hot tire pressures that we started with, and the associated performance of those rollout tire pressures were a train wreck. Okay, so let's swap over to Motec and let's see the first thing that we got going on with Motec. Uh, let's turn off iRacing and let's look at Motec. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to open up, like I said, I have all these different cars I like to drive or work on or something like that. Um, and I actually have individual projects for each individual car. Um, every one is a, is a work in progress. Excuse me while I scratch an itch. Um, but just like anything else that has to deal with vehicle dynamics or setups or things like that, you... They evolve over time, and then you make a good uh, project for it. So here we are, Daytona 2011 Road. We did seven horrific, horrific laps. Um, let me look at the world records here. And that's just for the road course. It didn't say day or night. Um, so you can see what mine was, 39.6. And I'm... I'm a middle of the road driver. I'll, I'll admit it. I am not. I don't have enough time to to invest in the in the sim to really start improving that last twenty percent to to really get super competitive. I I do during the winter time, but during the summertime, I just lose it all just because I have absolutely no time to to devote to this. Um, hey, there's me. Uh, where was I gonna go? Oh, Motec. Okay. So first things first, let's look at the suspension and see where we are as far as right height goes. <clears throat> and you can see down here, this is the the uh, front splitter. In the game, it has a, or actually in the garage, it has uh, the, right, the splitter right height. And in case you do not know, that sensor... That reading that you get is from the, the front lip of the splitter directly in the center. So it's not like midway, you know, through the splitter. Because the splitter might be 12 inches or 16 inches or however wide the splitter actually is, you know, front to back from the nose of the car that goes back underneath the, the nose of the car. Um, I don't know how long that is, but... And the... The sensor is right there on the front tip of that um, splitter. So that's where that is. As you can see, we're not coming anywhere close. And I should s do this. The, uh, the center front splitter, the actual sensor on the car, is the orange line that you can see in here. You have orange, red, and blue. I should probably change that 
to sort to for it to be a little more easy to to pick out but we're never anywhere close to to the track never ever ever so right then and there you can look at um that leads us to the ride heights so i like to do the average front and the average rear ride height to look at uh, right off the bat and you can see that even on like some of the straightaways even the slower stuff even the faster stuff under compression through turns um one and two, you're still not getting any. You're still not getting close to the to the track, and especially in a DP, the higher you are, the slower you're going, the less amount of downforce that you're getting. So we're we're almost three quarters of an inch off the ground, um, in the both front and the back, and then coming through three and four, you know, we're still not very high, and even coming through the trioval, we're still high in the air. So Right then and there, we're losing downforce, which could be a lot of the instability, so we're going to lower the car. So that's going to be the one thing that we're going to do. Okay. The second thing that we're going to do that is major, and we can do these, the car is so wrong that you can do these two things at the same time because we know it's wrong. Um, so we're going to be doing tire pressures, we're going to be doing ride heights, and then we're going to be doing the diff. So let's look at the differential. Mother of God. Um, so right all in here, you can see the mess that is our differential. Um, and in this particular MoTeC project, um, it measures the difference, which is right in here, of wheel speed between the left rear wheel and the right rear wheel. And it brings them down into a percentage. And we set in telemetry um, a maximum allowable percentage that is okay and anything above that setting that we put throws a flag which is up here so it's just an easy way to see when the differential is is uh, acceptable and when it's operating in an unacceptable thing so right here you can come over and you can see um, that the preload is actually not that bad because we don't see any flags in the preloads. Um, but we do see the entry differential flag. So that's coast ramp angle that we're going to be looking at. And there is a ton of exit stuff. So we can tell that while stable, it is not optimal. Um, so we're going to be dealing with that. And so you see a lot of flags here. And I keep coming over here because this is a good um, kind of quick glance of how bad it is. Um, optimal is zero. And this was 30 um, is kind of what we set the uh, the maximum flag to. It's just a random abstract number. So anywhere between 2 and 30 um, is what we see. And I've never had it open the entire time to see exactly where the average was. But... Um, this section here, these numbers are the average. So um, the entry stuff is going to be negative, and then the positive stuff is, is positive. Um, this is G-Wiz information, um, but you can see closer to zero, the better the differential is, is working. And when we get to the telemetry stuff, I'm going to show you all of this, um, all the background stuff of how I make this stuff come up on the screen. Um, if you don't have telemetry or anything like that, what you know is is that the car is behaving badly. And so you can start making changes. That's why we went to one extreme and the other extreme is you know you can start working your way in um, to optimal. So those are the three things we're going to go and fart around with now. We are going to go and we're going to do the... Uh, Just a second. Okay. So we're going to go and do this, the iRacing deal. So we're going to cut off that. Display capture. And then we're going to go into here and bring it up. And hopefully that will actually work. 
or maybe I'll just do this. Sorry, like I said, I'm still getting used to to streaming and things like that. Um, we'll do it like that. All right. Sorry, because I, I I race in full screen, <clears throat> not in windowed mode. Uh, just because it's less distracting. So, so here we go. Back in full window mode. All right. So, we know that that the tire pressures are a mess, and we're going to increase by two psi because we're so far off. We'll go two psi at a time. That way, we don't overshoot something, and that way we make uh, at least some progress going in a, in a better direction. Um, because if you went half degree increments and then go test, you'd be here forever. Um, so we know that we're massively off. And uh, so when you do that, then we can move on to the push rod lengths, which adjusts the ride heights. And see how far low we are. <clears throat> okay, so you see, you can only come so low before the the front splitter hits its minimum um, before it starts failing tech. So there's that, and then we're gonna get into some other interesting stuff here. So um, how we're gonna massage that because it's low in the garage, but it may not be low on the track. So how do you do that? <clears throat> you come around with the springs and you put softer springs in there. So while it's sitting in tech, it's high enough. But when you go out on the track, the softer spring is going to allow the car to compress down. And it's going to compress down onto the optimal height of the splitter. So that's what we're going to do there. And then we know we're going to do in the back. We come down a little more in the back. And they're symmetrical. You want to make sure that your ride heights are symmetrical. Or I should say your push rod lengths are symmetrical. <clears> okay. <throat> so for some weird reason, the rear geometry of the car likes different push rod lengths to keep them even. But the big thing to look at is the cross weight down here. You want to make sure that the, the cross weight's even. Because um, you want a 50 50 car. You want everything to be pretty close. Oh, it's a little nuance of the car. What I'm doing here is I'm just fooling around actually to see how you can get as close to a dynamic balanced car as you possibly can. And doesn't look like you can. All right, so we'll go back. Some of these, some of these cars they have on, on, in the world running around are a little different, a little odd, with how they want to make their um, stuff work. As far as uh, the geometry and, and different things like that, so, uh, again, it's not that huge of a deal, but it's just different, and I don't race this car enough to, to be comfortable with. Um, how it's supposed to, what's like what's normal, what the baseline is as far as like what's, uh, yeah, what's normal. So here we are. Let's see that. Okay. Because like the ride heights are the same, but the, uh, the corner weights are different and 49.9 is just as balanced as 51.1. So 
there we are with that. So let's save this as um, just something simple. There. That way we know where we're at. All right, so we did the tires. We did the ride heights. Now we're going to come over here and we're going to fool around with um, – the drivetrain and the differential. So we're good to go on here so far. Um, I can't mess around with the first gear yet because I haven't had gotten the car stable enough to even make an assertion of whether or not I need to change first gear or not. Um, we're going to leave the clutch friction faces alone. And as we saw, the preload, we weren't throwing any flags, so we were good there. So let's experiment and we'll take away a little bit of preload. Um, the drive ramp angle, um, you, the drive uh, side of the flags that we saw were pretty pretty messed up. So let's increase the locking there. And the coast rank angle wasn't as bad as the uh, as the drive angle or drive angle was. So let's just come up with that and. Uh, it was still being unlocked, so we need to increase the locking. And here's where we are with, um, you come into the relationship between these settings down here for the ramp angles and your clutch friction faces or your clutch plates and the relationship that it has. So remember, we're on the low end of the clutch friction faces or the uh, clutch plates. Um, so as you can see in the bottom here, the the multiplying the force multiplication of the the clutch and the job that they are doing um, isn't a lot yet. So you can look at that and you can go, well, we're we still need more locking on the on the coast ramp angle, but we're out of adjustment here. We are totally out of adjustment here. So let's go back up to four. We're gonna go back up to where we were there, and we're just gonna multiply the forces in the differential by increasing the clutch faces and we're going to see where we are with that. Um, done. Okay, so once more into the breach my dear friends. Once more into the breach. If you like Shakespeare. Okay, already the steering is much more stiff and that has everything to do with the tire pressures everything to do with the tire pressures I could take that flat out The instability is much better. So in the previous stint, I learned where the braking points were based on the stability of the car. And I just tried to do the same braking point there as I did before. And I was essentially stopped and waiting before the turn even came up. Yeah, even there is the same. Like, I went even further past my breaking point, and I still underdrove that bus stop, or the entry into the bus stop. Now, granted, a little bit of, of this is because we lowered the ride heights, and we increased the, the downforce on the car, and the efficiency of the downforce on the car. So we got more grip there, sure. Um, but the tires... Are much better. I mean, the car feels better. I'm just under driving the car now.
We're going to try the brake bias because the car is really unstable under braking. So we're just going to see if that does anything. So, as you get, as I get used to the, the new handling characteristics of the car, you can see, like, I've, I've been talking for a long time, but once you learn just the basic setup um, adjustments that you can make, the, the, the change that you can make in the car and give yourself a much, much better experience driving, I mean... I changed two things. Minor, minor things. And even though it took me a long time to explain them, once you learn them, I mean, that's, that's like five minutes. That's like five minutes of adjustment, and you go from something you may hate to something that is bearable. I got excited and overdrove the bus stop, but even that was a heck of a lot better than what it was before. Even underdriving the car through there was a death-defying experience, and I overdrove the crap out of it compared to what where we are with the setup. And uh You know, it was still manageable. My mind actually wandered through that corner onto toe settings and everything like that because the car is hunting under braking. You see it swerving back and forth. So dialing more front brake helps under braking, but the car wants to, you'll notice the car wants to hunt. The nose of the car wants to hunt back and forth, and that's that's an instability that could be a, a tow related issue. It could be a, maybe even a camber or a caster issue. But we still got sideways, so yay.
So even on angry tires, we're getting a bunch of green sectors. The exit out of that corner wasn't all, all that awesome. So we'll finish this lap and then pull it in. Now, I will tell you that I normally would finish that lap and practice pit entry. I would do it <clears throat> almost every single time. Um, and the reason is, is that pit entry, your, your pit lane delta that you have, um, can gain you a lot of time. It can. It can gain you a lot of time. So, okay, so we're looking at what we got here. And uh, break out the old trusty notebook and... Um, my pen. So the previous was 20 degrees starting out, and this one's 22 degrees starting out, and 26.9, uh, 27.8, Okay, so <clears throat> there you go with that. So we're getting a more better picture of what this car temperature wise or uh, hot pressure wise likes and uh, you can also see too um, the relationship between PSI and temperature um, I didn't write it down before I probably should have but as a general rule the higher the hot pressure the lower the temperatures are going to be so um, there's an operating range of both. They're they're interconnected. The the pressures and the temperatures are interconnected. So you have an optimum. I mean, how can I put this? The tire is designed to promote or to produce maximum amount of grip at a at a very specific temperature, um, very specific um, core temperature. So or carcass temperature. So that's what you're shooting for. But you're shooting for that by using pressure okay so right now 245 degrees 240 degrees back here 230 up there that's high that's um that's a lot of temperature in the tire and the hotter the tire gets um if you if you've been around racing enough or watch racing enough hot tire temperatures equal slick tires that's just that's just how it works so the object is to Keep increasing the tire cold pressures, and which should yield a hot pressure that's going to give you a temperature. And that temperature is going to it's going to finally settle down into an operating or into a uh, optimal tire temperature range. And um, so when you find out what that is, and you find out what the hot pressure is that gets you there, um, then you can say, okay. At Daytona, with a track temperature of this, start the cold pressures out at this, and that'll get you really close. And then you can go back and forth between, you know, half a pound and, and different things like that. So that's how the relationship of tires work. Um, but like I said, we started out at, at 20, and ah, it was it was a mess. So we're still good. We're gonna go up another two pounds. Again, not a huge swing that's going to take us completely out of uh, contention of where we are. But uh, we're also, the butt end of the, of the car is about as low as you can. You can't get any less um, downforce dialed in on the back. So that's something else we can look for. But... If you were here on the last podcast or the last uh, tutorial that I did, the last stream, um, I like setting a car up 
with the minimum amount of downforce that keeps the car balanced because aerodynamics and aerodynamic downforce is there to supplement mechanical grip. So the additional grip that aerodynamic downforce provides a vehicle should be on top of what you can get out of the car with mechanical grip just from the suspension. So um, if you do it like this and you start out with the minimum amount of um, aerodynamics, uh, aerodynamic downforce dialed into the car, then you can optimize to these two things separately and you can get the most out of both aspects of the car, both mechanical grip and aerodynamic grip. Um, so there's that. So while we're doing that, let's go back and check and see how the changes that we did with ride height and the diff worked out. Okay, so hopefully I just didn't, that, didn't do that whole stint with you guys having a black screen. I really hope I didn't. Um, I can, I'm checking the stream right now. Okay, great. Um, perfect. So there we are with that. So let's go back to MoTeC. Let's pull our racing off the thing and let's get us back to MoTeC. Cool. Um, if you're still, if you still stuck around through this, through like that long, open, long-winded, five or ten, fifteen, three-hour-long diatribe I had at the beginning, thank you. Um, and I, I tend to be verbose. I tend to talk a lot. Um, just because I try to give people the most complete picture of why things happen and why things work the way they work. Um, because once you do that, you start being able to see how things fit together and your setup process is actually going to go a lot, lot faster. So we didn't see a lot of a time improvement as far as the changes that we made, but the handling was hands down, head and shoulders above everything. So here we go. So you can see um, the differences here. So let me pull up the previous one, and you can see the difference. The black is the previous one. So you can see here. It was 0.22, now we're down to 0.215. Is that what that was? Yeah, at any rate. Um, you can see the difference between the two. So that was this last session. That was the previous session. See how worse the, the exit was? Versus now. So we did get improvements, but we were, quote unquote, on the stops of the adjustment capabilities of the rear differential. So that's good. We know that we're going in the right direction. Okay, so now let's look at the ride heights. The average front and the average rear, we're still above the, the track and ignore that. Um, but this right here, the, the yellow, is still pretty high up off the ground, and that's a balance of power thing, I would suspect. But we're still pretty high up off the ground, and if you remember correctly, we are at the minimum inspection height for the front splitter. We can't go any lower with ride height, but just a second. I'm going to show you exactly what we're going to do. Um, so. Let's look at the tires. Let me see if I actually did some work on what the optimum, no, I didn't, um, pressures were, and I did not. So that, I use one project, and I copy it to another car, and then I start making adjustments to the project to reflect that car. Um, and I obviously have not gotten to the tire pressures yet, or else this would be completely different. So, Okay. Let's go back to the suspension and let's look at the dynamic weight and see what we got going on. Um, 1150 and 1100s. So that's what we. That's what we're working with here. 
So I'm going to put that into into Motec so we can start checking the the dynamic weight transfer. And if you were here for the other stuff for the other two tutorials, um you'll you'll remember that I said that I have a uh a way of determining exactly how much weight is at each corner of the car and this is kind of the result of that and if you happen to also be wondering no I will not share this um, and the reason is is because it is a massive massive amount of research and work and trial and error that went into it and um, in racing these are the kind of advantages that, that people hold on to, even at my even at my track. I can walk up to anybody, really anybody, and say, hey, what setup do you have in your car? And they will tell me um, for, I don't say anybody, but, they, you know, m for the most part, most of the, the, the faster drivers, they'll tell you what they have in the car. You know, they'll tell you what direction to go. But when it comes down to these kind of technical details, they're not going to tell you this. Um, and they shouldn't. You know, that's their hard work that they put into it, and they shouldn't just hand it out. But for the sake of these tutorials and things like that, I want to illustrate how suspension changes and spring changes, how they work, and this is a, a really good way to do that. And to be completely honest, you don't need this. Um, you can set up the front springs and... Um, to get your your entry into the corner pretty good and everything like and your ride heights pretty good and then you can adjust the rear springs until you get optimal handling and once you do that you know what the the relationship is between the front springs and the rear springs that you need what split you need okay for a particular track so you'll know whenever you go to like Suzuka that hey if I'm gonna use 900 pound springs up front and this is just an example it's just I need 1250 springs in the back I need a 50 pound split or a, what is that 300 and no 250 pound split or whatever the hell it is um, that's the split that I need in the car and that's what it likes so I'm using 900 up front so X in the back that's how it works so you don't really need this so don't send me nasty grams saying oh you selfish prick no it's you don't really need it but it helps um, it makes the setup process go faster. So I don't care about these long, big, sweeping corners on the Daytona track. I don't care about those. I care about this corner right here. This this turn um, is the most important turn on the track. And the reason is is because it leads to a long, long, long straightaway. That's the reason for that. Um, and then the second most important corner on the track would be this one right here. Uh, was that turn three? I don't, I don't know all the turns names in this because it goes to another faster section of the infield. So right here, let's look at it's a it's a left hand turn. So we're gonna be looking at the right side tires, and we can see that we're pushing like a dump truck. Okay. So that's awesome. Um, so you can see the average of the dynamic loading on the car here, and that is about 400 pounds, I don't know, 380 pounds heavier um, up front than we are on the back. Okay, cool. Um, so what else that does is, is it tells us through this corner here um, where the aerodynamic or actually where the center of gravity balance is right there so it's a little further up front um, so we can come back here and see where we are as far as ride heights go now we can start fooling around with the uh, the aerodynamics of the car to see where we are I'm not changing anything I just want to see where we are seven seven eight nine thirty nine that should be one Uh, I forgot this car is like this.
you cannot get the ride heights high enough in this car in the aerodynamic in the aero calculator to to figure it out. So yay, we're winging it. Uh, lovely. So if I'm not mistaken, we upped the uh, the tire pressures. Let's look back here at the the rear differential again and see just to make sure we're going to do what we need to do. Okay. So if you remember, we took away preload, and all of a sudden we start getting flags again for preload. So we can go back and we can say, nope, 30 was good. 30 is good preload. And we can see that we're halfway decent on entry. We improved the entry with the clutch friction plate, or I'm just going to say clutch plates for God's sakes because that's a lot. To, that's a weird thing to say. And But we're also down at that. We're at the at the lower end of it. And we're at the high end of the drive ramp angle, and we're still seeing um, the differential disengage and unlock. So, boom. Let's multiply that again, and we'll go from 6 to 8, and let's go to ride heights. So, as we said, we can't really go any lower up here to the point where we go to that. So we're going to go as low as we possibly can there. And we're going to lower the rears too. Okay, so that's about a half an inch. All right, that's where we're going to start. And everything else is pretty good. Now, the, like I said, the car is still hunting on entry. And usually when that happens, it could be a caster issue or it could be a tow issue. Um, I kind of noticed this along one of the updates last year, the year before, really had to do with this. But um, so more positive casters, more overseer while you're going into a turn. But it could also be whenever you're lowering the car or slowing the car down. So let's just do that. We're going to go even lower, do 8.5, and see if that helps with the hunting of the car. And we keep going up on the on the camber too. So apparently these two things are connected and they are. They they both are measured off of the spindle of the of the tire. So as you bring the the camber in, you can also change the caster. It just depends on how the the control arms that go from the chassis to the spindle are connected to the car. So if you change one, you may change another. Um, so, and that also changes the toe. So if you're wondering how in depth this iRacing is and how they model the, the suspension up front, everything is connected. And everything that I just did, if I had to go do that in the car, if I said, hey, I'm gonna change the caster I want to go to a less aggressive caster. I'd have to go back and I have to check the camber, and then I'd have to go back and check the toe and reset everything. Um, that's as realistic as you can possibly get. So there we are with that. So let's go back to racing. All right. So we made a couple more changes. We're gonna see how this goes. I may have to turn this into a maybe a two-parter. But you guys are getting the the gist of it because I have to go to work here in about uh, an hour. So here we go again. Okay, I think the camber helped a lot. Because you see the, the car, the nose of the car isn't hunting anymore. And I can be a lot more 
stable going into the corners, which results in obviously better sector times. Turn one's going to be the telltale. Got greedy. Still faster. So people ask, you know, how much is setup and how much is driver and things like that. And everyone's like, oh, road racing is all about the driver. Eh, not really. Um, because you can see how setup changes affect the, uh, the lap times. I blew that corner. Damn it. So it's... It's a combination of both. I'm not going to say that it's not, but it's not as minimalistic as people make it out to be as far as the setup is concerned in relationship to road course performance. push the limits a little bit just to see what would happen. I was trying to do a late entry with a late apex to try and straighten out the exit, but that did not work out that well.
So we're going to bring it in this time. Once again, check a little bit of telemetry. See where we are. And somebody had mentioned that uh, on the stream, the uh, the engine noise and the ambient um, the ambient noise of the sim wasn't very loud. Um, and I had turned that down just so y you could hear me. Um, but apparently, and I I went back and I looked at it too, and it, you can't even hear it. So okay, so if you remember. We were in like the 240-ish range, so every increase that we made in the PSI has brought the temperatures down, so that's good. Um, now we're up to the 30s as far as the, the hot pressures go, and it's it's still, it's it didn't feel as, like as much of an improvement as it did from 20 to 22 as it did from 22 to 24. So um, basically, I'm going to call, I'm going to say that we're, going to be getting close to being in the ballpark of, of what the optimal hot tire pressures are for close. I don't think we're there yet. We don't have the, we don't have the setup dialed into the point where we can actually start going, okay, let's optimize the tire pressures. Let's optimize this. Right now we're just trying to get the, the thing to, to be comfortable and stable and um, rough in as much performance into the car as you possibly can. So like if I had to I explained making setups along the lines of, of making a sculpture. You know, you get this big block of marble, and it's just square. There's nothing there. And, you know, if you're going to sculpt a, a person, you know, you don't start with the eyes. You know what I'm saying? You you take away the most of the of the marble, and you start roughing in oh like you know this is going to be the torso this is going to be the the legs and things like that and it, it, you don't go into you know this is an individual finger or this is an individual earlobe or something like that you don't you don't do that um in making a setup you don't start there so you rough in the setup so right now we're still in that rough in phase so we saw the uh tire pressure changes and things like that and we can see where we're at with the uh <clears throat> excuse me with the tire temperatures and one of the things that I'm going to start looking at now is that we're starting to get a little closer um to starting the next phase of of everything so the first phase like I said is is setting the right heights getting the rake right setting up the differential and then roughing in the tire pressures um so that that process is almost is almost finished. Um, what, what I'm going to look at now is is that we know we're at the low end of the spectrum as far as the right heights go. And is it is it me or does it just seem to you every time we come back in here, I have to keep lowering the right height because I take it down to the minimum where it would do that and make the splitter right height fail and then go out and race and then come back in and I have to go down more clicks. So that seems weird. This car has always been weird. I probably shouldn't have chosen this, this Corvette because this car has some bugs to it. Um, but, okay. So, we roughed in, got the tire pressures kind of where they need to be and we're going to go and we're going to look at the right heights again and then we're going to look at the differential again and see how that all worked. And just make sure that, yeah, cool. I'm on the uh, telemetry. Okay. Let's pull up the next, this last session that we did and see where we are. So you can see, like, the changes in, in performance. So we started out at a 43.85. Made a decent swing at it. wasn't very good. We're at forty three seven eight. Not that big of a deal. And now we're starting to start to see major stuff. You know, we're you're talking over a second and a half. 
or over a second. So like a second and a quarter. That was the last improvements, you know. And so I'm going to harp on this, you know. If you're afraid of doing setups, you can follow what we've done right now, and chances are you're going to improve your lap times by a massive amount, you know. So, um, and we really haven't got into the super technical aspects of setup building yet. So, okay, so here we are with the, look at the differential since it's already pulled up. And uh, you can see where that is there. So let's look at this previous one. So I do believe, yeah, you can see that there's still more uh, unlocking there. And the exit seems to have improved. Perhaps a tad, perhaps not. So, yes, you can see just in that section that's not covered up. I'll try and minimize that. But uh, you can see between all this, you know, we've made the differential better. Like that was the first run. This was the first swing at it, and it was improved massively. And then we're making more and more improvements. So you can see, like, especially the exit diff that we're doing a lot of good stuff in, and the entry still needs a little bit more work. So there's that, which is good. Um, we're going to come back to that again because we're going to try and keep this in order. Uh, so let's go back, and we're still look at uh, suspension positions and things like that. And you can see that we're still pretty high up as far as the front splitter the individual ride heights here we're getting close we're getting lower but we're not low enough yet okay so as I said we are running out of adjustments on the push rod lengths because we're starting to hit that ride height right cool this is how you start really messing stuff around I'm um, not messing up, but this is how you start. This is the artwork of of setups. It's like, okay, well, ride heights, we can't get any lower. No, we can't. Not with the ride heights. But, as I said at the beginning of the stream, we can go, let's take away 100 pounds on the front spring, so they're going to compress a lot. They're going to press a, compress a little more. Um, and as you can see, where too low on the right heights now or the uh, splitter okay so we'll bring it back up to that um, to so it passes and I'm gonna get more in depth in springs and spring rates and why that just did why it what it did and and how it affects the on track stuff like what it's going to do on track I'll hit on it real quick here so um, we had 1150 springs up front so that means 1150 pounds of pressure of weight is going to compress that spring one inch okay so now you could say the spring is going to compress one inch with only 1050 pounds on it okay so if we are going to take let's just use ballpark numbers and we're going to say there is 2000 pounds of downforce being applied on the car okay so with an 1100 pound spring you take 2000 pounds of downforce divided by the spring rate so pounds divided by pounds per inch is going to re um, is going to give you inches that spring is going to s compress 1.82 inches okay so what did we do now we put in a lighter spring right so we have 2,000 pounds of pressure still being applied on the car divide that by 1050 and the result is 
that spring is going to now compress 1.90 inches. So you, can you see how like we're going to massage the car down um, lower and lower to its its, its optimal um, ride height and optimal splitter height um, using a combination of the push rod lengths or spring perches in a NASCAR car and spring rate. So this is how these two things work together. All right. Um, it's not really super complicated as long as you understand what's happening. So that's what's happening. Um, so that's going to help there. And if you remember back in the, uh, the dynamic weight stuff, at that weight through some of these corners, we were still too heavy on the front. Okay. So let's just use this corner for the sake of continuity. So we're using that corner and we're still, you know, however many hundreds of pounds, um, more on the front than we are on the back. Okay. Also in the spring tutorial, that's going to be coming up. The stiffness of the springs determines, or I should say the spring rate determines how much weight is going to be sent to that particular corner of the car. Okay. So with 1,150 pounds of, or 1,150 pounds per inch spring rate, of the, the spring we put in there, I'm not going to keep using the spring rate. We have an 1,150 pound spring in the front. That's how we're going to talk about it because that's how we talk about it in the real world. Um, through that particular corner, it throws 1,645 pounds up to the front car, to the, to the right front tire. That's where it goes. Okay, that's too much. We can see that it's too much here. <clears throat> the car itself, that CG diagram that we put in the, in the in the beginning of the this tutorial, the car still weighs the same. Okay, it's just the spring rates determine how much of that weight is going to be sent to a corner of a car dynamically. So we went through 1,150 pounds spring, sends 1,645 pounds to that right front tire, and 1,230 to the back tire using, I think it's an 1,100 pound spring. Okay, we're going to change that because the car is not balanced. You can see that here. So we're going to kill like three birds with one stone by putting in that lighter spring. So number one, we get to get the car to, to squat more to get the splitter down more, which is going to generate more downforce, less drag, and we're going to dynamically balance the car better, okay? So we're doing those three things with one change, and that's what that's where that comes from there. Cool. Awesome. So we're going to keep the, the rear springs at 1,100, and we're going to come back over here to the drivetrain, and we're going to look back again here at the, uh, the transmission, and we're going to look at the diff. All right. Um, so we're making a lot of progress on the exit half of the, the differential. We are not making that much progress on the entry. Uh, as a matter of fact, we still went backwards just a little bit on the preload. So let's dial in more preload, just a little, because we know we're ballpark. And we can't go, I don't want to go any lower on the coast side, because I don't want to be up against the stop. Okay? And remember, we still have... Two more um, options for the clutch plates. So we're going to go to 10. Okay. So where we are now is you're going to see, like, when you start making these adjustments, you're going to get to a threshold. You're going to get, like, to a tipping point. And it's almost like, uh, I don't want to put it, like, torquing down like a, a bolt. Like, you're going to get to a point where it's going to be good, and then you're going to snap it. Okay, so you're going to go to a point with the diff where it's like you've hit this, this, I, keep, I don't want to keep repeating point, but you go to this, this point where it's a boundary in between uh, the maximum performance you can get out of eight clutch plates and then the next set of clutch plates. And then you're going to see that the, these ramp angles are going to have to start getting changed um, a little more. 
uh, versus what we are now. We really haven't touched them. We've 70, 40, we've left them, and we just keep increasing the clutch plates. Eventually, we're going to get to a point where we've, we've multiplied the forces on the differential enough that we're going to have to start fiddling with the drive plate or the drive ramp angles and things like that. Uh, so there's that. And we're going to keep the tires, the cold PSIs, we're going to keep them exactly where they are. They're probably in the ballpark. We're going to save this again. No, as B2. And we're going to go back out on track. Okay, I don't know if you noticed it through the kink. Scott, watch the track. Uh, if you notice it through the kink, but before we made that spring change, we would be drifting out through that kink, further out towards the edge of the, the outside edge of the track, and we made that one 100-pound change, and the car cut through that corner that much better. The reason is, is because we stopped sending more weight to the front tire, the right front tire, which means less oversteer or understeer. That also means that you're going to have less understeer through the bus stop. The car is going to cut more and everything like that. So good change. Cutting through here better. You can see the time. The time that we gained through there, it's a probably about a quarter of a second that we gained. Now, I let the car drift out that much on that turn because that keeps speed up. But on the previous lap, I turned the wheel how much I was turning the wheel before, and you saw how much more it cut into the to the, towards the apex of the inside of the turn. So now I can go, I don't have to turn the wheel that much going through that corner, and which means you're going to be faster. So you can see how understanding how dynamic weight transfer works can make you faster. Still a little, under sta uh, a little unstable under heavy braking, but that could also be um, dampers. See, I left a lot in that turn.
Mm, damn it. Still unstable under braking. But that's all right. So again, the car feels better. Um, I am improving times through certain sectors of the corn uh, through the track. Uh, some of the other stuff that I'm screwing up on, I'm I'm more comfortable with the car, so I'm pushing the car harder. Like the last time through this caris uh, through this bus stop, and uh, talking and driving strikes again. Um, so you're making improvements and you're roughing this stuff in, and. Uh, that's probably going to be where I'm going to end the tutorial today because it's actually a very natural breaking point between um, roughing the setup in to um, doing the uh, getting into a little more of the detail work. Um, so it's a very, very natural place to stop. Um, so as a quick review... Um, we went over how, like what your, your baseline stuff is. Like when you first load up and you're starting to set up from scratch and you're starting from a, an iRacing fixed baseline setup, um, where to go and, and what to do. So you started talking about tire pressures, you talk about ARBs and different things like that. And you can go back and you can see all that stuff of, of where to set, um, some of the most important stuff fundamentally with a car where to set that so it'll be stable for you it'll get you in the right maybe the right ballpark maybe the right town that the ballpark is in um and where to start and then we you go into how to look at the uh the right heights and the chassis stuff uh the, the right heights and then choosing springs and uh working on the the differential and then working on the the initial um, gear selection for that particular track. Um, and then we went back into m massaging the differential and really getting that working a little more optimally. And uh, we went into a, a more depth about spring selection and dynamic weight transfer and how springs affect that. And uh, that's actually a, a really, really good place to stop. So, what we're going to do is we've saved it. We're going to quit out of this, and then we're going to go into telemetry, and I want to double-check the, the rear differential and just make sure that the changes that we made were in the right direction. So, here we are back again. Telemetry, let's pull up that last stint. And it's about the same. Okay. A tad bit better, but still about the same. Still getting a little bit of lock up with the uh, the entry preload and the diff, uh, and the yeah the preload and the entry side, and still a little bit on the exit side. But let me explain something else. Um, how this all kind of works together too. Um, 
what the diff does is greatly dependent on the amount of grip that the tires have, okay? So if the tires don't have a lot of grip, the differential is going to be locking and unlocking um, differently than whenever we get to the point where we optimize the grip. So um, going into corners and under, you know, max braking and acceleration and stuff like that, where the diff does most of its work, we may not be optimizing the handling of the car, which means that we're breaking tires loose, which means the differential is getting confused. So that's a that's a issue too. So I've said this before, and I want to reiterate it again before we sign off of this. But doing a setup is circular, you know, um, and each circle that you complete makes the setup a little bit better. It kind of goes hand in hand with the the example I was using for for sculpting, roughing something in. Um, it kind of goes hand in hand with that. So like the first circle that we do kind of just gets us into a general ballpark of something that we can handle from a baseline setup. Then we go make changes and we do that group of changes. Then we go out and we race again and we see how good we we did there. And then you kind of revisit the same setup parameters in the garage over and over and over again. And that's what we call dialing in a setup, massaging a setup, and different things like that. So that's how that's how it works. But um, the rotations that you get in the cycles later on in the setup process start yielding less and less of a return um, because you've you've carved out as much time as you possibly can easily. Now you're searching for a tenth. Now you're searching for a hundredth, you know, stuff like that. Like it's easy to take a, a setup that's completely unbalanced and a, a total mess and carve out a second and a half out of that setup. It's easy. Um, you saw that. We did it, you know, two cycles and we were almost two seconds faster than what we were whenever we started. So, um, Keep that in mind. You know, that's where the uh, the super fast guys are super fast. That's why. Because they will find all these places on the track that they can gain an advantage of a tenth, two tenths over somebody. And if there's 13 corners in a, in, a, in a circuit and they're better than just about everybody else in 10 of them and they're two tenths faster out of each one of those, I mean, you know, you're, you're talking seconds. That's why they're so fast and that's why they're so good. But... Um, so this, this basic, um, beginning part one now that we're going to do is, uh, is the start of that process. So, uh, again, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I hope I didn't bore you too much. Uh, I hope I gave the explanations in, in easy to understand terms and, and I, I hope you were able to wrap your head around it. Um, if not like the first time through, maybe go back again and watch it and rewatch it and, and stuff like that. So, um. Please subscribe. I'd appreciate it. Um, if I get to 100, then I have like a permanent link um, that, that I can just send out. Um, so that I think that helps. I think that's how that works. Um, but I'm still getting used to, to streaming and, and different stuff. So um, there may be some technical difficulties here and there or some things that, that I'm not doing like uh, that other, you know, more experienced streamers would, would be doing. Um, so... If there's any suggestions along those fronts, be sure to PM me. My name in the si in this service is the same as it is now, Scott Bolster. I'm the only one. Uh, if you have any suggestions for how I can make an explanation better, please do so. Um, or if you want to see something very, very specific about how a setup works or like uh, some aspect of a setup, um, ask. You know, chances are I'll probably be getting to it because I'm going to go make tutorials based on the actual garage screens in iRacing. So there's that. So again, thank you very much for watching, and uh, I hope you guys subscribe and tune in again. My, my streaming schedule is going to be around uh, Monday mornings. Um, I'm off. I don't have to be at work uh, until a little after 2. And then Wednesdays and Thursdays, I have a little bit of time between the time I get home from work and between – and my fiance gets home from work, and then I have a massive amount of time on Friday because Fridays are my days off. And Fridays are usually dedicated to setting up 
um, the IndyCar, um, getting ready for the soft races. So that's going to be my pretty much my streaming schedule for the most part. It just depends if I'm working on like a, a tutorial that has to be produced that I'm recording um, versus streaming and whatnot. But at any rate, again, for the last time, thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe if you have any questions, um, suggestions, message me. Okay, you guys have a great day, and I'll see you guys on the track.